All right. Good morning once again, church. How are we doing? Good. It's so good to see all of you. And uh, I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles to uh, 2 Peter uh, chapter 2. And um, if you have been with us in the series of uh, walking through 2 Peter, uh, what we've seen is that um, Peter begins the, the, the letter on a, a real high note. Um, he, he really comes in and he says, um, hey, uh, God has given you all these incredible gifts, these treasures in Jesus Christ. Once you come to faith in him, you're just gifted all these incredible things and these resources to have everything you need for your life, to live in a godly way, to give, live with, with joy and purpose and peace. And so because he's given those to you, um, he, he encourages us to, to make every effort to live in the way that Jesus has called us to live and so that we can experience that fullness and that, that as we have the, these qualities growing in us and increasing and becoming more and more that we can feel certain that we can know that our salvation is secure in Jesus and that we are saved and that we are held uh, in his hands. Um, but then in chapter 2, he, he turns and he says, but hey, I, I need to give you a warning. There were going to be false teachers that are going to come in. And so we spent the past, past four weeks talking about the dangers of these false teachers. And we looked at the examples. Uh, we dug uh, deep into each of these Old Testament examples that he pulls out of the, the fallen angels and the false prophets of, of old. He talked about Noah and the time of the flood. He talked about Lot and the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and he talked about Balaam and the donkey. And he, and he was saying, hey, listen, God knows how to judge the wicked and God knows how to save the righteous. He has the ability to do that and he can and he will do that for you. So don't get discouraged when it looks like evil is, is winning. Don't, look, don't, don't lose hope when it looks like the tide is turning in the wrong direction. God is sovereign and he is in control. Uh, but as, as he concludes uh, the, the second chapter, and, and realize, obviously, Peter didn't write in chapters. He wrote a letter, and, and in history, they added the numbers in there so we could kind of keep track of where we were at in the letter, right? But, but it's one kind of cohesive uh, thought. But the, what we're going to look at today is 2 Peter uh, chapter 2, verses 17 through 22. And um, it's, it's a word of encouragement uh, for a, a situation where you see somebody... You feel like they're, they're a believer. You feel like they're walking with Jesus. You feel like they're a part of the church. And all of a sudden, you see them turn away. And I'm sure that many of you have experienced this, that you've seen this, and you know the unique pain that there is when you see somebody who you thought was a brother or sister in Christ suddenly turn and abandon, abandon the church, abandon the faith, abandon the relationships. Uh, it's painful and, and what it can ultimately do is cause us to question like, well, hey, if it happened to them, could it happen to me? Could I lose my salvation? And so we're going we're gonna to talk about that uh, today. But we're, we're going to talk about this, this, this challenging issue because church is really, uh, it's, this, it's this amazing thing where we have this individual salvation uh, that Jesus came and he died on the cross for your sins, for my sins. The more that we understand the individual nature of salvation, the more powerful it is. That if I was the only one who sinned, that Jesus still would have came and gave in his life for me. That's, that, that's, that's really what causes you to cross the threshold into a relationship with him. But once you're in, he says, hey, I don't, I, it's not just about you individually with God. Now you're part of a community. Now you're part of a family. And so when, when, when a member of the family departs, turns, goes into sin, it, it, it hurts the whole family. And so, so we're going to look at a little bit of this, this sort of family healing today, and we're going to look at how do we, how do we make sense of this when this happens? Um, uh, I've shared kind of briefly, uh, you know, I have, a, I have a good friend who this, this describes very uh, personally. This is, a, this is a personal thing for me, and, and, and I don't want to share too much detail because it's my prayer that he will come back. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, God willing, if he listens to this sermon online at some point, I don't want him to be like, dude, you totally called me out by name, right? So... Um, but a good friend of mine, somebody that I was very close with, somebody who professed a faith in Christ, and somebody who I saw completely abandon that faith and, and make a shipwreck out of their life. And, um, and, and so, so what we're going to talk about today is, is really personally relevant for me as I sort of process, what, man, how do I deal with that? What, what do I think about that? What do, what do I make of that? And so I'm sure for a number of you, you're in similar situations where uh, where you've had to process what it was like when somebody you love and care for and called a friend um, turned their back on Jesus. So, uh, so we're in 2 Peter chapter 2, 
uh, beginning in verse 17. Uh, he says, These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. And so let's, let's remember here that this is, what he's describing here are these false teachers, these ones that come in and speak falsely and seek to lure people away from a true faith in, in Christ, the true gospel. So he says they're like waterless springs and mist driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For, for speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Just a light, fluffy passage for Father's Day, right? I'm just trying to keep it, just trying to keep it uplifting, right? <laughs> Man, God's Word, I love it. Even when it cuts down to, to the very core of things, you walk away like, it's like a good workout, right? You're like, man, that was tough. That was painful. I'm sweating. I'm going to be feeling that tomorrow, but I'm so glad I did it, right? And that's, and this is one of those, this is one of those. This is a hit interval here, right? We're doing high intensity interval training in God's Word this morning. So first I want to look at who is it that these, these false teachers, these false prophets, who is it that they target? Who is it that they go after? And we see the answer to this in verse 18. It says, For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. Essentially, they're going after immature believers. And, and originally, in my notes, I had even written new converts. People who have just come into the faith. But as I studied and as I prayed and as I thought about it more, it's like, that's not necessarily true. Um, those who are, who are barely escaping from those who live in error are not necessarily just people who have just recently come to faith in Christ. Um, sometimes it's people who grew up in church their whole entire life. Uh, because here's, here's part of the reality. Change is difficult. Uh, do we agree? We all, we, we all struggle with change. Change is always, changing a diet is hard, changing patterns is hard, changing jobs is hard, right? And so sometimes people are born into a family that goes to church, and the easiest thing for them to do is just to keep going to church. And it's not like they, they knowingly or willingly deny the claims of Jesus, but they just kind of become inoculated to them over time. They just kind of go through the motions and, yeah, I go to church and stuff, but, uh, but there's not a sense in which the gospel has captured and transformed their heart. And so even though they're regular in attendance and, and everyone outwardly would look and say, oh, yeah, that person's totally a Christian, it's, it's only, it's only uh, at the surface level. It hasn't made its way into the depths of their heart. And, and so one of the, the, the telltale signs of this is, is it's people who um, are barely escaping from the flesh. So essentially this, this spirit of saying like, hey, if, uh, uh, well, here's what my buddy used to say. Um, he'd be like, man, if, uh, if drugs weren't illegal, I would totally do them. I would do all of them, right? This is my buddy who would profess to be a believer, but the, the world had this pull on him, right? Where it was his morality saying, hey, I know they're illegal and I know God doesn't want me to do them, so I'm not going to do them. But if I could, I would. And eventually he did. Um, it's, it, it, it's, uh, if you hear a testimony of somebody and they say, yeah, you know what, for, for 30 years I indulged in every pleasure of the world. I did everything that I could. I, I, if you name it and it's sin, I did it. And then I found Jesus and then I turned to him and I left all that behind. And if you hear that testimony, you're like, wow, that's a dream scenario. I get to do all the stuff that I ever wanted to do and then get to come to faith and be forgiven of it. If that's where your heart is, it's a sign that the world still has its hooks in you, Right? Because if you ask that person, if you go up to them afterwards, they're like, man, it sounds like you got the best of both worlds. You got to do it all and come to Jesus. They'll look at you and be like, don't be crazy. I, 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 don't, I don't cherish a single moment that I spent separated from Christ. Right? And so, so, so those that are barely escaping from the, the, the flesh are particularly 
uh, prone to temptations of the flesh, right? Like, hey, what if, what if nobody knew and nobody could see and you would never get caught, would you do it? Right? If, if, if that's the spot where you're at, then this is a, this is a message of warning for you today. Um, and, and here's how the process of maturity lo- works in, in, in dealing with sin. We read God's word to know right from wrong. How do I know right from wrong? Right? Every day we go through, uh, we go through our life and we sort of have these, these feelings like, oh man, I feel like that's the wrong thing to do or I feel like that's the right thing to do. But I don't know about you, but I can't trust my heart. <laughs> my heart has led me wrong a bunch of times where I thought <laughs> it felt like the right thing to do and I found out that it was not the right thing to do. So I've, I've learned to just distrust the natural inclinations of my heart. And rather to come to God's word and say, hey God, if you say that it's, it's good and it's, it's honorable and it's worthy, then I'm going to pursue that. And if you say that it's no good, even if it's what my heart wants, I'm going to turn away from that because I trust that you know better than I do. And what I've found over time is that when you do that and you begin to live in obedience, over time God begins to reveal to you where you come to the place where you have these epiphanies of like, oh wow, now I understand why God said that's a bad idea. And you guys ever watch that show, uh, Sister Wives, that's on TLC? <laughs> Anybody ever seen that, right? Where it's this guy who's living this polygamous lifestyle and he's got multiple wives. And uh, I don't look at that guy and envy him for one second, right? <laughs> like, what a, what a nightmare. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Just talk about taking fire and pouring it into your lap. Like, why, why would you do that, right? Like, fathers, uh, husbands, like, am I right? Like, it's, it's, it's all I can take to, to honor and love one wife, right? <laughs> like, that's, you know, and now we're starting to divide loyalties and divide, like, that, uh, that's crazy, right? But, that, but that's what people, um, uh, they're, they're drawn to this. And, and I, could name, I could name sin after sin where when I was a young man, I was like, oh, man, that'd be cool if God would say yes to that. But now as, as an older man, I look at it and I say, man, thank God. <laughs> he knows better than we know. And so we, that's why coming to his word is so important. And that's why all of his word is so important. Because the temptation with these false teachers is to say, hey, 99% of this, yep, absolutely. But there's a couple things in here that God says that, that we've grown and evolved to understand that, that he was wrong about that. He, he got most of it right, but there's a few things in here that, um, that, that, that you don't have to obey. I know the Bible says that, but if we twist the Greek around a little bit, we can get to a place where we can say that just was for back then and not for today. And what we're doing is we're trying to outsmart God. We're trying to rationalize and justify it. So, so the target of these false teachers is those who are looking for an excuse to say that sin is okay. Their heart is drawing towards it. And if we're honest, that's everybody in this room at one level or another. Um, but the key to get out of that, to grow in maturity, is to read God's word, to know what he says, and put it into practice. And I promise you, little by little, you're going to understand that the world makes a lot more sense God's way than your own way. And so what is the strategy of these false teachers? Once they, they identify the targets that they're going after, where it, well, it really talks about three things, right? It t- talks about them speaking with this sort of assertive, uh, big, uh, ornate, uh, wordy confidence. It talks about them appealing to the lust of the flesh. And it talks about them promising freedom. And so it says, again, in verse 18, it says, uh, For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions the, of the flesh, those who are barely escaping from those who live in air. Um, it's this Greek word, and I'm not real good with Greek, so I can uh, try and pronounce it, but, uh, you know, it's hooper ankos. Uh, and the definition is of excessive weight or size. So in your translation, if you don't have the ESV, it might not say loud boasts of folly. It might say something about bragging or, or boasting or, or something along those lines. It can be translated as immoderate, boastful, excessive, or pompous. Essentially, they come in and they speak with a lot of boldness and confidence about like uh, with these big words and people are like, well, they seem confident and they seem to know what they're talking about. So I'm just going to trust that, that they're experts on this subject. And the other way that it, that it shows it's itself, another way that these words are these sort of intentionally open and ambiguous statements. These big, open, uh, uh, undefined sort of statements, 
right? Like, hey, it's, it's just all about love. Well, all about love can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, right? There's probably not a word that is more, <laughs> has more multiple meanings and translations than love in our language. And so like, hey, man, I'm just about, I'm not about religion. I'm not about Christianity or I'm just about love. I'm just, I'm just here to love people. And the question is, well, how do you know what love is? How is love defined? Right? The more, the, more, the more general, the more generic, the more vague it's left, the easier it is to draw people in because they apply their own thinking of what they think that it means. Um, so let's talk in specifics, right? At this time, there was a group. If you remember, uh, Jesus was constantly in arguments with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And one of the distinctives between those two groups is the Sadducees did not believe in the, the, the resurrection of the dead. They didn't believe in the afterlife. And so uh, the, the, the Hebrew uh, uh, believers, those who came out of the Jewish faith and came into Christianity, brought some of those preconceived ideas with them. And so there was this idea, this, this heresy that he was, he was fighting against at this time, that they would, here's the flow of logic. They would say, there is no afterlife, therefore there is no judgment. And if there's no judgment, then what difference does morality make here on earth, Right? What, what prevents us from doing whatever we want if there's ultimately no accountability or no judge? And so the underlying idea was like, hey, you can say that you follow Jesus and you can do whatever you want. <laughs> Your actions don't have to, to follow with what you say that you believe because ultimately there's nobody holding you accountable. There is no judgment. There is no afterlife. And so uh, essentially eat, drink, and be merry. Do whatever you want. Now somebody that wants to do whatever they want is going to be drawn to that sort of message, right? Right? And there's variations of that that exist in our culture today. Nobody is saying that specific thing. Um, but one of them is, right, God exists for your prosperity. This is something that we hear attached to the Christian life a lot. And, and the way that they present it, every message is incredibly encouraging, incredibly empowering. It's like, hey, you're, you're a good person who's made a couple little mistakes and God doesn't care about that. He wants to just pour blessing on you. You just got to do these things that I'm going to tell you to do and tune in next week, right? And so it's, it's this, this twisting, it's this big, broad, open. There isn't discussion of sin and repentance and how sin separates us from God and, and of our need to live lives of holiness and obedience and, and self-sacrifice and humility. And so it's an overemphasis of one side instead of the other and people are drawn to it because it's an appealing message, right? If somebody comes to you and says, hey, I know how God can give you a, a better car and a bigger house and more money in your bank account and, and perfect health. Like, which one of us honestly doesn't want to sign up for that, right? The only problem is it doesn't square with, with the message of the Bible. Think about, think about Jesus, first of all. Nothing in the bank account. Never had a romantic relationship. Died in his 30s. He was beaten. He was mocked, right? Like, if Jesus is our role model, how do you square that with this sort of idea that God exists to give you a yacht? It, do, it doesn't make sense, and yet, by, by leaving things vague and open, and I'm not saying that God doesn't want to bless you. Man, I've been blessed beyond what I deserve in this life, and so God is a good father. He loves to bless his kids, so don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not telling us all that we should be this, you know, lowly, kicking the ground, like, oh, I guess, you know, being a Christian means you're just nobody, right? No, he wants, he wants you to just pour yourself out for him, but he wants you to learn in maturity uh, how, to, how to, be, uh, to do well with a lot and to how to do well with a little, right? How to do well when you're sick, how to do well when you're well. He wants you to, to know how to do all things through Christ. Uh, A.W. Tozer called it the blessedness of possessing nothing. He said, I can have things but they're not my possessions. In fact, nothing in this world is mine. I recognize that. And when you realize that nothing in this world is yours, you're a steward of things that God gives to you for a season. And, and if you do well with them, he'll give you possibly more to do more, to be generous. We're told that we're, we're blessed to be generous to others. And so if you're a good investment, God may choose to invest more into you to bless other people. But none of it's yours. You just want to be a conduit of blessing to other people. And so, so as we grow, 
God gives us what we can handle. And sometimes, as I talked about a couple weeks ago, the worst thing that any, could happen for any of us is to win the lottery, right? Like just to pour fuel on our sinful desires. And so God in his love and mercy has kept you from winning the lottery. I want you to know that, right? <laughs> it's because he loves you. There's other variations of this, right? There's a, the, another false doctrine is, uh, you know, we are the, the, the select few, Everyone else around us is wrong. Everyone else around us is wicked. And we are the, the, the tiny, uh, isolated enclave of chosen people. And all the isms come out of this, right? Like this extreme nationalism, uh, racism, classism, sexism. All these things come out of saying, hey, we're the only ones who get it. We're the only ones who understand what God really wants. And all those people out there, they don't get it. And it, and, it, and it speaks in these grand sort of um, hyperbole where they say, you know, uh, that it's always and it's never and, and, it, and it doesn't come with the balance and the love of Jesus. Uh, the reality is, is that we are uh, all sinners <laughs> and that we are all in need of the grace of God. And my sin might look a little different than your sin or your sin, but we are all people who are prone to sin and who need the salvation of Jesus in our life. And so that should lead us to be the most gracious the most loving of all people. Because everyone out there is just like us, separated from God by sin, but offer the possibility of reconciliation through the cross. The, the, the other end of this is a sort of defeatism. Have you been in churches where this is sort of the thing of like, well, I guess we're the final holdouts of the true Christian faith. You know, the world is crumbling around us and, uh, and everyone is wicked and we're living in the middle of Sodom and Gomorrah and uh, I guess we'll just come here in our sad little way and kind of go through the motions because I guess this is all that's left. Man, that's not what God wants for us either. We, we're people who know how the story ends. We know that Jesus has won the victory. We should live in confidence and excitement about that. We should be encouraged by, by what he has done. We should live with boldness. And we should be continually inviting others in and expecting that people are going to respond to his gracious offer. The, uh, over the years, I've, I've, um, I've gotten a, a variation of the same sort of phone call or email um, where somebody will say, hey, I was, I was kind of looking at your website, I was kind of checking out your church, and, and here's my question, are you open and affirming, is the question. And so, the alternative is, are you closed and denying? Right? Are you open and affirming, or are you closed and denying, is essentially what they're asking. And I look at that, and I say, I don't, I don't think Jesus was either one of those. I think the tax collectors threw parties that were open and affirming and they said, whoever you are, whatever you're into, whatever, you're, I don't care about any of that. Just come, party with us. What happens here stays here. It's all good. The Pharisees were closed and denying. They said, hey, you, all you people, stay away. You're not even welcome into our home. You can't have a meal with us. We don't want to touch you. You'll make us unclean. We want nothing to do with you. But what Jesus said is, hey, I want to enter in and I want to have meals and I want to have conversation and I want to have a relationship with everybody. But at the end of it, I'm going to share truth and I'm going to say, go and sin no more. I'm going to encourage and challenge you to walk in obedience to Jesus. And, and, and that's who we are as a church, <laughs> right? The doors are wide open to everybody. We want everyone to come and to, to, to gather and to, to hear the word, to hear the truth of Jesus. And as a community, we want to wrap our arms around everybody. But we want to continue to come back to the truth. And, and there's truth in here that, that I need to hear that's going to require me to change. Because that's kind of the question, right? The question is, hey, can I come in and be a part of your community and not change? And the answer for everybody is no. You can't come to, you can't come to the community of Jesus Christ and not change. The gospel is always changing us. It's always transforming us. It's always bringing us out of self-centeredness and into other-centeredness. Man, I, I feel like I'm in the middle of that. I, I just, man, I, I feel like recently I've just become more aware of a whole other layer of self-centeredness in, in, in my heart that I need to get out of. And it's painful, and it's not easy, um, but, but I have two choices. I can harden my heart and justify my actions, or I can, I can repent. And so 
that's where I'm at. But, but I invite everybody, man, if we're not changing, if we're not coming in line with, with, with Scripture, then we're not being transformed into the bride, and that's what he wants for us. Because here's what it says. It says that sin makes us captives. To whatever, um, whatever, for whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. Man, sin doesn't present itself that way, right? It doesn't say, hey, come. <laughs> I, I want to offer you slavery. That's not the way sin, sin puts it. Sin promises freedom. Sin says, hey, come, and everything you ever wanted, it, it'll be yours. There's no cost. <laughs> There's no limits. But the reality is, is that we are always limited by something. And so, so we can choose to, in obedience, allow God to limit our life and say, here's the fences within which you can find enjoyment and purpose and hope and peace and actual freedom within these limits. Or you can go outside the limits and, and in whatever it is, and you can try and pursue freedom there, but nothing else other than God is going to ultimately offer us fulfillment. And for those of us that have been around for a little while, we know we've chased it in different places and we found, man, I thought that was going to make me happy, but that didn't make me happy. You know, I'm, I'm still rocking an iPhone 6 because I thought that was going to make me happy, right? And I think that was the one. It took me six to get to the point where I'm like, this doesn't actually make me happier. <laughs> Every new phone is not the magic cure-all. I say that as a joke. I know that it's not, but there's a part of us that retail therapy is a real thing, right? Like, I just got to go buy something and then I'll feel better. And you do for a little bit, but then you don't. Sin captivates us. And, 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 and so um, this idea of freedom, even self, even if you say, hey, you know what? I'm not going to submit to God. I'm not going to submit to anything. I'm only just going to submit to myself. Essentially, you become enslaved to the desires of your heart. And so whatever your heart wants to do, you just follow through. But what if you want to do something and you know <laughs> That it's not, right, you, you end up in this turmoil. You can become a slave to your own heart. And so, so what I would encourage you is to willingly submit to God and say, God, I want, I want you to be my king. I want to enter into your kingdom and I want you to, to set the course for me and I will obey what you tell me to do. That's the way to find fulfillment. That's the way to actually find happiness. And so we're deceived because we don't think of, of sin as enslavement, but that's what it is. And so, um, so what happens when, when, when somebody turns, turns away? Well, he says, for after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Essentially, what he's saying is this, that, that who we are is revealed over time. I, I really feel like, biblically, there's a number of passages that point to the fact that you cannot lose your salvation. If you've truly received salvation, if Jesus has changed your heart, if you know who he is, there is no turning back. And, 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 and part of it is because we were dead in our sins when Jesus saved us. And so our salvation was not earned by our works. And so therefore, our works can't remove it because it's tied to what Jesus did, not what we've done. But there can be the appearance of salvation without the reality of it. And Jesus talks about this in his parable of the sower and the seeds, right? He says, hey, they're throwing the seeds, which are the gospel. And, and in some of the places, it lands and it springs up and it starts coming up. But then uh, the sun scorches it or birds come and eat it. Um, and he says, that, or it gets withered by the cares of the world. And so ultimately, the, the, the plants that grow up and bear fruit are the ones in which the gospel has really taken root and salvation has occurred. But, but to somebody looking at a bunch of little saplings coming up, you don't know which one is which. And, and it's the same way in the Bible, but, but ultimately um, our nature will reveal itself. He said, like a dog. I've got a dog. He's a little chihuahua. His name's Hemi. Some of you guys have met him. He's super cute. But that dog does some disgusting things. <laughs> right? Why? Because he's a dog. <laughs> I've seen, I, I can't even describe some of the things I've seen that dog do, right? But he's a dog. That's, that's, that was his nature. That's what he was expected to do. Now, if you're sitting here 
and you're wondering like, oh man, am I a dog or <laughs> am I not? The very fact that you're convicted that you're wrestling, saying, man, I want to be saved. Am I saved? Is, is an indication that, that, that this Holy Spirit is working in your heart because a, a dead person, an unregenerate person, they don't care whether they're saved, right? And so if you're sitting here saying, man, I really want to know that I'm saved, I encourage you to go back to First Peter or Second Peter chapter 1 and look at it. And he says, you can have assurance of your salvation by living the way that God has called you to live. But the other part that's true here, and I'm sure you guys have seen this, when somebody's in, uh, truly in Christian community, whether they believe it or not, when they leave, there's no joy for them in sin. They might have an affair, they might go off and do their thing, they might jump into whatever indulgent sin or whatever, but when you talk to them, when you speak with them, there's this deep sadness in their eyes. There's this, this sorrow because they know what's right and they're choosing what's wrong. And so the sin just doesn't taste good to them. Now, out of pride, they might not be at a place where they're willing to say, yeah, I'm ready to turn back. I'm ready to go back. But, but they know once you've been exposed to the truth, once you know what it's meant to be, it, the sin just doesn't taste good anymore. And it's my prayer that, that, that God would continue to bring prodigals home, that even today that he might, through his word, bring someone who has wandered away into sin back. And the good news is, is that he... He desires that. He wants us. It's not his desire that anyone should perish, but he wants us all to come close to him. And I'll, I'll conclude by jumping back up to the beginning of the passage. Uh, it says these are, these are waterless springs. These are mist driven by a storm. If you think about it, there's really three types of water, right? There, there's, there's natural water. There's the water that we love to drink that's necessary for life. You can't go more than a few days without water. So it's good. It's a gift from God. It's necessary. It's something we pursue. But as soon as you drink it, a couple hours later, what's the problem? You're thirsty again, right? You become dehydrated. You need to continually go back and get the water. Now what these false prophets are offering are, are these, these waterless springs. It's the promise of water and fulfillment without the follow-through. It's like going through a desert and, and hoping for this oasis, and when you get to it, you find out that it's a mirage. And then you feel despair and you feel discouragement because you thought you were going to be satisfied and you're not. It's, it's like a mist driven by a storm, and there's two different ways that, that commentators look at this. One is that in this region, in this area, sometimes these, these big, puffy, beautiful-looking rain clouds would gather in a season of drought, and people would be excited, like, oh, good, the rains are finally coming. And then a strong wind would come, and it would blow them away, and they wouldn't receive the rain. The other way to think about it is, is, a, is a mist driven by the storm. If you're, you're in a dry season and you're desiring rain and then when the rain finally comes, it's not a gentle soaking rain, but it's this, uh, this hurricane force with, with winds and flash floods and what you wanted so more, actually, it, you wanted it so much, but now it's destroying your life. What, what, what the false prophets, what the false teaching promises, it never actually fulfills. But then there's a third kind of water, the living water. This is what Jesus promised to the Samaritan woman at the well. He said, hey, will you get me a drink? And she's like, I'm amazed that you would, you're, you're Jewish and I'm a Samaritan and how could you ask me for a drink of water? I'm your natural enemy. And he says, well, if you knew who I was, you would ask me for a drink of living water and you'd never thirst again. He's referencing a, a, a passage in, in Jeremiah where Jeremiah says this. He says, uh, Jeremiah 2.13, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me the fountain of living waters, and they have hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. See, Jesus, all the things that the false prophets promise, Jesus fulfills. He gives us lasting hope. He gives us the water that will never leave us thirsty again, a spring of water in our soul that will continually nourish and provide for us. He gives us ultimately the desires of our heart by changing our heart to mirror his. <laughs> and then when his will is accomplished, our heart rejoices. Jesus is the only one who can offer what all these other things promise. And my hope and prayer for you is that if you've never found that living water in Jesus, that today, that you would come and drink deeply from his fountain.